what pirates did and where it where they I think are are good is that you can use a pirate ship as a kind of a microcosm of how we should exist together because you just like we're on a ship in the middle of the ocean we've got to survive we've got enemies all around us no safe place to harbor because we're now enemies of the state and we have to exist together we have to exist in in some kind of harmony and how are we going to do that and that's that urgency um that they had is really useful to put yourself in that scenario um perhaps we haven't felt that urgency until now and say okay what are the principles here um and the things that emerge well you know we all have to be heard we have to we will have to have a, um, and, and I guess one of the facts that I love about how pirates made decisions was when they decided the articles in a pirate code, they had to be unanimous vote. There was not, even if one person disagreed with one of the, one of the articles, it didn't go in because that was that slight 1% risk of mutiny was not worth it. So, um, you know, it was real, real unanimous decision-making completely different to the kind of government lawmaking that we have now where it's imposed upon people alexandra alex barker is my guest on this episode of inside ideas brought to you by 1.5 media and innovators magazine alex leads be more pirate a global social movement and anti-consultancy that she began life as a book by social entrepreneur, Sam Conniff. Since joining Sam, she has fostered a network of thousands of individuals and organizations who have turned pirate and are actively challenging the status quo in their work and lives. Within the movement, she splits her time between writing, research, running workshops, and growing the network but it was a long road to piracy. After studying in middle, uh, middle East politics, Alex spent time traveling and working in the region, beginning her career in international development, detouring to social care before becoming communications manager at a think tank, the RSA, Royal Society of Arts. Having always been fascinated by why systems fail and what it takes to make them succeed, she found in the story of pirates the answers to some long-standing questions. Since then, she has written a, a follow-up book, How to Be More Pirate, documenting the insights from their movement, a frontline perspective on the courage and conviction required to rewrite the rules of the 21st century. Alongside building the movement, Alex works with businesses, universities, NGOs, and the public sector supporting them to overhaul their culture, take more risks, and be more ambitious with how they can support a wider systems change. Alex, thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see you again. Thanks so much, Mark. It's such a pleasure. So we, we uh, first saw each other online. You were online with many other people, so I don't even know if you noticed me, but you were giving an online kind of insight to be more pirate and a little presentation and it was uh, absolutely beautiful. I was uh, sleeping and in the dark and had not bought the book yet. By the time uh, I heard that presentation, I'd heard some rumors and discussions about it here and there and, and uh, that people were, were um, joining the pirate movement. And so I went out and got uh, a copy and read it in one day and then reread it again on the audiobook version and uh, here it is R be more pirate <laughs> yeah and uh, I guess that's a that's a lot that uh, has to do with the book but uh, also had a little bit of an insight on the new book coming up but uh, before we get into all of that I want to know with this um, Middle East studies and, and what you have learned has uh, not only with Be More Pirate, but in your think tanks and your experiences, seeing older systems, NGOs and charities come and go and fail and kind of feel that frustration, which I've felt as well. Has any of that helped you to weather this pandemic to uh, fare the swashbuckling seas of uh, uh, dystopia and uh, pandemics and things? How have you weathered this time 
uh, up until now? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it definitely has. And when I started working with Sam and on, on the pirate movement, I thought long and hard about what qualifies me to do this. You know, I don't, I don't quite know. We're very used to having official qualifications and, and skills that we've, and I thought it's bravery, actually. I, I think before I joined Sam, I took quite a few risks and a few leaps out of my previous life, um, personally and professionally. And being able to stand there in front of people and say, it's fine. Um, it, it will be, it's rough for a bit and then it's fine. And your life will probably go in, um, you know, waves like that in the way that people are experiencing at this moment and sa and saying it with conviction, I think is really reassuring. So I've, I've weathered it. I've weathered the storm. Okay. I think my biggest problem always is a ten slight tendency to overwork and, and get really stuck into things. Um, I'd long lost my faith in traditional leadership and the systems and institutions that we have. Um, that happened after Brexit. Um, I was sitting in a think tank and I didn't see a single person, maybe one actually, and that person wasn't the usual type of person who got recruited, um, who, who saw it coming, who saw the result coming. Everyone was pretty convinced that they were, that we were going to um, stay in the European Union and then, you know, the shock and the, <laughs> but also the sense of like, wow, we're, we're missing something. We, all of us are smart, university educated people. We're missing something. And when, and we, for whatever reason, are not looking in the right places. So, and, but the, the worst thing, the, 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 I guess the most disappointing thing about it was we didn't rectify anything after that. We didn't say, okay, so how do we change how we behave and the kind of way we do things in order to enable ensure that next time we do have the answers <laughs> i think we just we kind of carried on the same way and, and the inability to pull yourself out of the, the the same structures and ways of being that you've always you, that you're used to is something that is just um i guess a pandemic of, of um of doing things the way that they've always been done and i just was craving something else and i didn't know what it was um but i did find it in pirates that's fabulous. You've, you've done probably quite a few presentations and workshops and, and helped a lot of people over this time. Those who were kind of early adopters on the pirate movement and, and things that you, you kind of try to guide them and teach them and show them, you know, how to think in a different way, how to change the system. Um, have you heard any good stories how they've weathered the pandemic, if it's been better? if being a, a swashbuckling pirate or someone who is really disrupting the system or doing things in a different way, if that's a better business model, if that's a better system to operate in, in times of a pandemic, in times of uh, great unrest, it's not just the pandemic, it's also, you know, as you mentioned, the, the Brexit, the Trump apocalypses, the Bolsonaro's, the Putin's, the Shays, you know, the things that happened in Beirut, Black Lives Matter, um, mm. many, many, many things that are now bubbling to the surface and, and ha happening, whether they're climate catastrophe, capitalism, or whatever it is, just this, this unrest is coming. But are, are you seeing signs that that this way of thinking and this way of acting is, is kind of a better business model to get you through difficult times? Yeah, I, uh, I'll speak to a couple of specific examples and then also say that I have seen, you've, I've seen a change in people. I've seen a realization that the system is more fragile than they, than they anticipated and that stability might be an illusion um, to an extent, to a greater extent than they anticipated. I've seen that in my own family, realizing that actually... Uh, maybe things are going to continue more in this vein of uncertainty than than returning exactly back to what was before. But I think, you know, I'll speak to, in the UK, we've obviously had um, uh, a, a, a government response, a local government response, and also a community response to the pandemic. And we've seen lots and lots of mutual aid groups pop up where, you know, people have self-organized. They have said, we will just fill the gaps. We know the people who are going to suffer. We know the people who are who are more vulnerable. We need to get food to them ASAP. We just they've created their own list of these are resources we need. In the way that we were starting to fill the gaps with time bank, um, not time banks, food banks, um, because of lack of government support. So that's kind of accelerated. And what I've seen, and I've, I've noticed it on Twitter, I've noticed it through our, our network, who many of whom are involved in health and social care here, 
I've seen them, them go, we, this red tape that we have around volunteering, it's not working. You've got 750,000 people volunteering for the NHS, and most of those people didn't get a response um, because the system can't keep up. So people are turning to their mutual aid groups and going, we don't need a 10 page risk assessment here. We don't need um, a DBS check necessarily. We need some core, some key simple principles that people can adhere to, to ensure that we stay safe. We need to adhere to the social distancing. We need to be respectful um, and, you know, wash our hands <laughs> and wear our masks. And by and large, then therefore we will step into that gap. So yeah, I've actively seen that. And I put a little bit about that in the book about the, the nature of the rules that we need we need to have. We need to be a bit better and a bit uh, um, more okay um, mentally with not mitigating every single risk every time. Because the bigger risk is that people fall through the gaps, and they have been for many years here. So I've I've really seen that start to shift. It's whether we can now protect it, whether those mutual aid groups won't be you know co-opted or um, they'll manage. You know, because a lot of that um, volunteering capacity was enabled by people being furloughed, and I don't know if we'll be able to maintain that as people go back to work full time. Um, and whether the mindset shift will have been long enough for people to, to really kind of hold down. But a lot of people now have that in their collective memory. So people are going back into work in their organizations in the voluntary sector, in the, in local government are kind of bringing that back in and going, actually this worked okay. And can we keep it? So that's definitely um, a shift. And just generally I've seen people think more deeply about the implications um, that, of the climate um, and that this might be a drill, as I think Extinction Rebellion have said, you know, yeah. treat this as a drill. Um, and I've seen, yeah, just a few more people questioning their life decisions um, and on what on what matters, um, whether it's, you know, a, a greater emphasis on family and friends, decisions like maybe not um, having children, big, big things. Um, so definitely, yeah, there's, there's a noticeable um, shift. Is there any shift in, in, in the pirates or the businesses or the foundations or the groups that you work with in a, a more positive direction where it really say, hey, we, we, we made a shift, you know, whether it was mm. 2019 or, or the beginning of this year to, to, to have more pirate be in our business model. And actually it's helped us weather the storm better. Is, yeah, is there some examples like that as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it was a great example that came up just a couple of weeks ago. And I asked her to come and talk to another group of pirates on, in one of our meetups. Um, they, it's a, a woman called Kate. She runs a logistics company. So very much involved in, you know, transferring goods from off to offices and back and yeah. forth. And um, she made a shift to be more pirate starting around a couple of years ago really when the book came out and as it's said it's been a it's been a journey of two years but she's like ultimately it has allowed us to weather this pandemic storm better than we could have anticipated um and really that had to do with um their values and the behaviors that emanate from those values and making sure that everybody was on board with that and understanding what it meant to be in that company and just almost moving their culture further towards the kind of relational than, than the transactional. So rather than everybody focusing just on, this is my task, I have to execute it. People were more concerned about the, the relationships between the people in the business, making sure that they were tight. There was a hell of a lot of trust there. So when things did hit, you know, hit the fan that people knew that they could rely on each other and that there was a, just a fundamental understanding of, of everybody's, that everybody was on the same page. And I know that sounds a little bit vague, but that really is the foundation, I think, of being more pirate and having a pirate. It's not, you know, I, I always say like, there is no one business model that works perfectly. Um, it is about how the feeling of the crew, of, of the culture that you have, are you all in this together? And then you kind of work out the particular ways of working from there that suits you. Um, and I also just um, would say, you know, perhaps a bit more of a practical example. Um, this is not, this is, well, it's, it's someone in the wider crew, but there's an example in Be More Pirate, um, for those who've read it will know, uh, that Sam um, mentions Cressy Westling, who founded a, um, a sustainability, luxury sustainability brand called Elvis and Cressy, where she um, rescues waste material and turns them into luxury accessories. Um and we interviewed her for our forthcoming podcast. Um, and she, she said, you know, our, the reason we weathered the storm so well is because we, our supply chain, um, because our supply chain is really ethical. Um, so we don't, we, we, everything is done quite locally and it's, um, 
everything so handcrafted and we do everything at a slower pace so it just wasn't but and that was an environmental um kind of a consideration rather than a you know pandemic consideration but now in the pandemic um she's just not had the same problems that a lot of people who are importing things from china had initially um everything's kind of done locally in kent in there and then it takes longer and it's handcrafted and that's her version of what luxury actually should be and what it means so yeah that that um she described as a, as a real success and a win for them i really have to agree with that um it's really as you said uh, so eloquently it's not just one business model fits all but what it is uh, that most people kind of don't understand it's it's a real resilient business model because mm. you're, you're you're automatically kind of doing things if you do things resiliently or kind of a little bit more of this disruptive pirate way you build in sustainability is built in there automatically and it puts businesses and companies in a unique position that when problems occur whether it's a resources water drought uh, floods or, or natural catastrophes or a pandemic or, or governmental conflicts that disrupt the system, those systems, because the way they're structured are very resilient, they're put in a unique position. Not all of them, but the majority of them are put in a unique position that they're now able to help others with food, with logistics, with uh, pivoting on a dime to make respirators or masks or deliver critical vital uh, services or just to remain in business because their sources and their uh, sustainable supply chain is very local or regional, mm. that those, those things actually provide a nice infrastructure. Something you said earlier and something I just kind of touched upon, um, I, 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 you're obviously probably not an expert, but you are living through it, you're experiencing it, you mentioned the Brexit, and so I'd like to kind of just poke our head down down that and I, I maybe ask you a question uh, and see if you have the answer or what your thoughts or feelings are on that. Um, I, I think I've, generally our audience can, can tell your, your thoughts or feelings on that. But my question is a big portion of the vote to move was because of all the immigrants uh, and outside workers that were in, in Brexit. The majority of those being agriculture, food and beverage servers, uh, harvesters uh, in that industry for food. Um, and it was somewhere in the upward amounts of over 200,000 people every year that were seasonal workers that came in and out or tried to stay or not. Um, the vote would be not just to get rid and not have those people in there, but it's because of the jobs that they were supposedly taking from local people, um, which would lead me to believe or which would lead me to say, why in the hell are so many people in, in the United Kingdom being furloughed? Why didn't they step into those jobs that they voted for to get rid of those immigrant workers and, and, and uh, help that food from being not wasted and tilled back under into the ground. You know what I mean? Because during this Brexit time, during this pandemic and lockdown, there's, we're getting numerous stories. My local friends in the United Kingdom are saying, a lot of farmers are tilling their food back right into the ground because there's not enough harvesters to pick and package and, and, and ship that on its way and deliver it. Mm. There's not a system in place. So, why didn't all the people who voted jump into those positions that they voted to get rid of? <laughs> uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I would expect that a, a lot of people who perhaps voted um, on the basis of, of feeling that immigration was a big problem and jobs were being taken certainly wouldn't, didn't see themselves in those roles. That wasn't, that's not the point of it um so i'm not that doesn't surprise me at all to be honest with you um yeah i i mean i don't know i think there's a there's a lot of um i mean going going a bit broader on that question there's a general problem with sort of sis i call it system literacy i don't think that people necessarily understand and this is not to, for me to sound patronizing because i would even say you know like i said with a think tank background i don't understand 
um, all the intricacies of the system. We're, we're dealing with a lot of complexity and nobody really gets educated on any of that. Uh, what happens when you pull out this part of the system and, and don't fill it adequately? And no, you know, our, our government, I think, is it's broadly understood that not wildly prepared for this scenario in a sense of figuring out very quickly what would happen when you did all this stuff. I don't, definitely don't think we were, I mean, we can't even reach a decision on Brexit, let alone planning for what would happen when you start to pull plugs in, yeah. in it all. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a good, yeah, it's a good question. I definitely don't have the answer to that at all. That's um, okay. I didn't expect <laughs> you to. I just, I, I know you have some thoughts and feelings and it is very complex and you touched the, the hit the nail on the head. Uh, the problem with a lot of their system or systems in the world, not only in, in Brexit or the UK, is that a lot of our ministries, our governments, our departments in those, they're not run like a system. They're run like a siloed facet of a much complexer system, and they don't communicate very well with each other. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm an entrepreneur and advocate and activist and do many, many other things. And if I were to go just with one of my projects to the uh, German government and, and, and ask for support and, and, and help for um, approvals on renewable energy and agriculture and different things that, that I would like to do. When I present that, they're like, oh, that's the Ministry of Agriculture you need to speak to. But it's not because it's also that Ministry of Energy. And it's also the Ministry of Transportation. And it, there's so many different ministries involved and all of them want to push you off to someone else or all of them want you to box, box you into one facet of that system. Mm -hmm. As someone who has thought or tried to understand systems um, uh, and uh, realizes how their, our current civilization frameworks or systems that we have out there in place worldwide, U.S., uh, Africa, China, um, the United Kingdom, wherever they are, they're not working for humanity anymore. There's more uh, civil unrest. There's more people uncomfortable because there's decisions being made and they're not being made for the benefit of everyone on our planet. You know, decisions in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Brazil from Bolsonaro were to let the Amazon rainforest burn just doesn't affect Brazil, it affects the whole world and, and our environment. And so um, with systems in mind and how we're feeling this, that these civil uh, civilization frameworks aren't working for us anymore, would you say that uh, the model or the being more pirate or how to be more pirate, is that a system that functions well? Is that one good on all layers of of uh, human physiological needs on uh, social and biosphere needs on economic needs. And, and, and is mm. that a pretty good model or? or uh, yeah. <laughs> tell me well, depends a on whether more about we're, that. Yeah. It depends on whether you're talking about pirates in the historical sense or in the, in the modern sense. And you know, there's obviously there's parallels, but it's, it's slightly different. And it's really interesting. There's so many things you brought up there that are fascinating to me. Like you can touch hundred, on all of them. Oh my goodness. Like silos, like that's, you know, what, what I guess I'm talking about would be more pirate. I, I would describe it as one part personal development, one part activism, and one part kind of system change or organizational change. And that, you know, we can, you can apply it to the micro or the macro, um, depending on where you are. But I bring the personal development because I think it does, it starts from there. You can't look at your organization, for example, without really looking at the, the bigger world, the big picture. Um, so they all integrate and, and this is what I, exactly what I want. And some, perhaps a reason why you can't always, people can't always quite figure out Be More Pyrex. Like, what is this? I want to put it in a category. Is it a business book? And I'm like, no, it's everything. Because really we are all everything. Like we are not, you know, we don't exist. We don't actually exist in silos as you've, have you, as you described. And I've had lots of experiences like that with government and stuff. Um, but I think in terms of a, it being a, a useful model, yeah, in that because in that respect, I do think it is. And there's another thing you just said where you said the systems are failing, they're not working for us anywhere. But have they ever worked, really? Because I think this is a weird moment for us Westerners where we're going, oh my God, you know, it's failing because we're going to be influenced by this pollution from somewhere else and the whole world's going to melt. But people who've, who've existed in, in poverty and in de economically developing countries who predominantly have been exploited by the West in previous centuries you probably think, well, this is how it's always been. And you know, the fact that you're waking up now is frankly irrelevant. 
Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I, um, I don't think it's, it's necessarily ever worked. Um, what pirates did and where it, where they, I think are, are good is that you can use a pirate ship as a kind of a microcosm of how we should exist together because you just like, we're on a ship in the middle of the ocean. We've got to survive. We've got enemies all around us. No pl- safe place to harbor because we're now enemies of the state. Um, we have to exist together. We have to exist in, in some kind of harmony. And how are we going to do that? And that's that urgency um, that they had is really useful to put yourself in that scenario. Um, perhaps we haven't felt that urgency until now and say, okay, what are the principles here? Um, and the things that emerge were, you know, we will have to be heard. We have to, we will have to have a, um, and, and I guess one of the facts that I love about how pirates made decisions was when they decided the articles in a pirate code, they had to be unanimous vote. There was not, even if one person disagreed with one of the, one of the articles, it didn't go in because that was that slight 1% risk of mutiny was not worth it. So, um, you know, it was real, real unanimous decision-making completely different to the kind of government lawmaking that we have now where it's imposed upon people. Um, and, you know, then it emerged from there, you know, they didn't, they didn't bury the things that we've buried for long. You know, if, if people were having same sex relationships on a pirate ship, they celebrated it. They were like, right, well that's exists. That exists. So we're not going to, despite, you know, the, the, the civilizations that we've come from and the societies that we've, what we've been taught to think here's the reality. And so we work with that. We work with reality. Um, and then, and, and that in it also meant not being actually that idealistic or utopian about humanity going, we've all got egos. We have to acknowledge the ego within the collective. So there's a level of competition and collaboration that exists in humanity. So I think there's a, yeah, there's a something really realistic about pirates. I love, and it just makes it so much better than some of the social change movements. I feel that I've been involved in previously where it's all a bit like, yeah, we're do-gooders. And I don't think, you know, so we're not do-gooders. We're not all good. Uh, all the time of course we're not that's why you know but we also there's a huge amount of people who are um aware that um you know that 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 it's exploitative and i think the the key like the key for me is the bravery it's the it's the ability to stand up and push back i think you can be you know you can be a bit arrogant you can be um a bit selfish sometimes and we all are but that key thing in, in terms of making change is the ability to, when you do see something that isn't right, um, not ignoring it. And it's been fascinating with Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, seeing people go, oh, wow, that does exist. And um, the, and, and, and it, it's been, a, yeah, I think the moment that's, why it feels different but with Black Lives Matter is, in, in this particular incarnation of it has probably been the, the pause that we've had with, with COVID that's allowed um, people to pay more attention to a, a protest movement in a way that they haven't before. But the realization I've seen amongst my peers as well, that this is about unpicking a system and that these small contributions that you make are important. And the contribution that you're making is your silence, is your, you're turning the other way because you're too busy, you're too distracted. There's another cause over here that maybe is more important to you. Um, and how that all stacks up to a system. And that's, that's what I, again, like to get to with pirates is, you know, if you th- want to think about a system, like you are part of it, you are contributing to it all the time. And these little actions that you take or don't take really matter. Um, but, but less so in the sense of like the way that we maybe talk about environmentalism and people going vegan and saying, well, you know, you make your contribution, let's stop eating meat. And yes, that might be important, but I think where you're really powerful is in a in a moment and in a place where you actually do have some influence, like in your in your team meeting, for example, and you're the sort of fairly senior person, and there's some decisions happening, and you're kind of going, mm, "Don't want to rock the boat." That's the moment for you to to step into it, and that's unlike any other kind of protest we've seen before, because you're not surrounded necessarily by a crowd, you don't have people backing you there, probably people expecting you to conform, and that's the moment when you've got to be pirate. <laughs> Yeah, it's not it's not always about the conformity, but it really is about um, collaboration and cooperation and, and the bigger picture. I like how you say that we're you know the pirates we're all on the same ship. We don't have a harbor, and as a climate activist, environmentalist, uh, and the things that I do, um, 
we're all on spaceship Earth. So actually, mm -hmm. that leads so nicely into the, the, the first major question I have for you is, do you consider yourself a global citizen? And how would you feel about the removal of all borders, walls, and separations, divisions of humanity from one another? Um, do you think mm -hmm. we could still be pirates in, in a world where we're all global citizens on the same spaceship Earth? Um, so as, how would I feel about it? Um, you know, in theory, I'm fine. I'm on a personal, emotional level, I feel fine about it. I don't particularly feel that my identity is, is wedded to my nationality. Um, and I think, you know, if people have said it to me before, a friend said it to me over the weekend, you know, about Brexit, when we got back onto that dreaded subject, um, you know, people in London feel more in common with people in Barcelona than they do with people in crew in London. So we're already, in a sense, have a sense of our, our global citizenship. Um, but, so, but I, it's an interesting one because to be global, to be truly global means essentially accepting all kinds of, of life and that doesn't just mean seeing yourself as part of the, the metropolitan cosmopolitan um, uh, view of the world. It means really marrying up all the views of the world and being okay with all of that. So I'd like to think that I would, but I don't think that um, I don't want, I wouldn't want to, you know, not, not acknowledge that there would be resist that I would have resistance to some of it. And I would also be concerned about what would actually practically happen if you started to um, tear down borders. Um, and I think, I mean, in, in a really microcosm sense, I, I suggested this to my previous workplace when I left. I was like, I think, because it's separated into three departments. And I said, tear down the walls. I said, we're not all going to, well, we're not actually all going towards the same goal. We are in rhetoric, but we're not in practice because we all have separate KPIs and they actually clash with each other quite often. And that's why I essentially see the world like that. We are, we have different, because of the differences of economies, we are um, at cross, you know, cross purposes in our objectives for what is good for our people. So perhaps the only answer to that is to, but I would do it in an, exp I would do it in a, in a staggered way. <laughs> so it'd be like, let's try one border first, <laughs> see what happens. Um, and it's really, it's interesting because so, okay, you're on a pirate ship and we're just analogy and, and exam, you know, from the book and from things, you're on a ship, you're all together, you got to work together at whether, you mm -hmm. know, it's the ship or organization or business or whatever it is. Let's just spread that ship a little bit bigger. It's the, the biggest ship we know of, it's planet earth and we're all mm -hmm. on that ship together and we still have cultures, we still have uh, uh, extreme diversity and difference and cultures and languages uh, and genders. Um, but we're all on the same ship. We're all crew members on the same ship. We're all unified in this global uh, operating system, this global mission uh, mm -hmm. that's m one that has never existed before, but is on our planet. Um, why, why, why couldn't we just make it bigger than, than, than the pirate ship? Why couldn't we expand that more? Yeah, well, yeah, and there's the, the issue of, I mean, pirates really had the proximity of each other. But we, we kind of have it in a sense of we can see each other through the media, but then you become desensitized to media. So I'd be interested to know what it is that sustains the emotional connection of um, citizens around the world, just feeling part of one entire um, ship. And just going back to your previous question about, you know, sh you know being, can we extend pirates to this to apply a pirate sort of mindset or um model to this i the answer is actually no because pirates exist in opposition in opposition to the navy so you can't really i mean i talk about this in the, in the new book about what does what do we mean when we say the navy and i've um defined it as a concentration of power so and power can mean anything i mean it doesn't have to be the establishment in the way that we've traditionally understood it like governments or um, it could be the media, it could be, um, you know, the advertising industry, um, all the big companies that hold all our data. Um, so there's only a need for pirates when there is that opposition moment. So if we really did start to shift and see ourselves as part of one, 
would it be would it be necessary um perhaps not i i it's definitely a dilemma it's something that we need to kind of maybe dissect or find some sense making out of it because i'm also in agreement with you that there has to be a form of balance there's always going to be good and bad there's always going to be a, you know uh, a choice between two goods or two bads you know but there's got to be some kind of a balance what i don't i, I you know i even though the Trumpocalypse, the bolts and arrows, the Shays, the Putins, the Erdogan's, the Duartes, and the list is too late, big to go on, are out there, they're still distant cousins of mine and yours uh, uh, as uh, Homo sapiens, uh, and uh, we may disagree, but we've got to find a, a new global operating system that works for us all, and that <clears throat> that there's a, this a balance held. Um, because we're really pushing the boundaries in, in, in many areas. And I really like the application of uh, being more pirate into business models and disruption and also trying to find and improve systems and uh, create new ways of looking and working together because I see all governments, businesses, corporations, organizations as an organism, a living organism, an organization that is living and molded that really, if it doesn't have that model, it's really limited by its growth and the amount of time it will be here on this earth because it's not something that can sustain itself. And uh, that's, that's what's really occurred around the world. Now, those who have had older business models and and uh, older ways of doing things that were very linear or siloed or very um, negative impactful corporations, organizations, they've been disrupted. They've gone away, they're being fined. They're realizing, oh my gosh, you know, uh, here's the, the small guys or these disruptors, they're changing the entire industry and we need to get up to speed. So uh, I, I don't, believe I have all the answers, but it would be nice to see how we could give some tools to not only my listeners, but those who read mm -hmm. Be More Pri Pirate uh, and uh, how to be more pirate and give them some empowerment and tools and ways to really see the world under a different lens and, and operate differently. That leads me to my first most difficult question for you, and I hope you're prepared. I, I don't know how well prepared you are because it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. Right now, we have been, uh, we're still kind of coming out of it and we're seeing different things of the pandemic where we're wearing masks, social distancing, mm -hmm. and all these measures in place. Um, but if you push current business models, you pu push current operating systems from governments and cities, out into the future is the next step, gas masks, oxygen masks, spacesuits. we're gonna live in bubbles, are we not going to operate or function? What systems are in place to save us, to make the future better? And that leads me to my burning question, WTF, which is not what the fuck, which most pirates would say, but it's what's the future, Alex? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, it's, it can go, it could go either way, couldn't it? And up until now, we have experienced this, I find this bizarre. We have sat back and allowed a very, very small amount of people to create things that have, that are now essentially rule our lives. Um, and some of them at the beginning felt benign, like Facebook, I've realized it's not so benign. And these tech yeah these technologies and i think the people creating them don't even really know what the consequences are of har harvesting all this data and um what what ai will do and that didn't really feature too much in discussions at elections either <laughs> so and it feels like we've been marching on in that direction of more and more technological technological innovation and i and i always put try to put a, a hand up and say whoa like with that, like, what do we even think about this? And the only answer that I've come up with when it comes to determining what the future could be in a more positive sense and determining, oh, the only, I guess, spanner in the works of the system that I can think of is to give people back a, 
and a greater sense of agency and 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 find ways mechanisms for people to regain their own sense of citizenship power and there are lots of different ways you can do that and it starts and and some of it starts with a mindset and that's some of the work that i'm trying to do with shifting people's you know real mentality about what is possible for me what are my limitations and what what is really holding me back that i can overcome but then there are some more practical um considerations and there's a campaign i'm going to mention because i i love it and i i've been started to work with them recently um called flat pack democracy in the uk and it's essentially like take over your local politics because it, it's a might be a secret weapon to, to save our democracy from from kind of always being quite top down and and feeling like you know it's just going to be more of the same um there's a few councils in the uk this is the local most local level the most community level and we have local town councillors and people don't really pay much attention to that because it's very local um and if we could encourage some different people and some people who are really invested in the in the communities that they live in to kind of take over those councils and it's not that you know there's, there's been a few people who've done it and proven that it's not that difficult to do and you can actually run a campaign on some quite fun principles and actually the perhaps the the tagline is that they didn't see us coming because they just didn't think that anyone would have the audacity um all the the balls to really go for it and then suddenly you found out you've got this this um uh this group of independents and the key thing here in the uk is that they are not part they're not associated with the labor party or the conservative party or even the green party um because the problem with party politics is that then you know they're so in opposition to each other it's like we can't do that because you're doing that when really like a green sustainable solution is just good for that town it doesn't you know it's not about whose idea it is so you're getting by being independents you're getting people to work together in a totally different sort of way and this was pioneered by a guy called peter mcfadden and he he did it in a small town in the southwest of england called Froome. and that, you know this is where i'm getting all this inspiration from because he's it's so pirate it, it encapsulates all the um principles of being pirate <laughs> even even the fun of it um and and, and just kind of going in and going, do you know what, we're going to do this. And as soon as they got into the council, they got handed this agenda that you get um, given by the government to say that this is how you'd run a town council. And he just goes, right, is any of this actually a legal requirement? And there's only that one thing. He goes, right, we'll do that. And then nothing else we're going to do. We're going to start from a blank slate. And they created these entirely different ways of working together. And there's, there's a few other, like there's lots of um, community power sharing, democratic movements and enterprises that I've seen over the years spring up around food sharing, things like Incredible Edible that help people to reclaim land, yeah, local land that's being unused and just use it for growing food, um, like library of things, sharing things. If these could scale properly and they had they were properly resourced and seen as solutions and that there was that you could enable people who do, you know, in, in local government to um give a bit of their power away and see these as the solutions that they need and allow people to get on with it. I think that could, that is edging towards a solution for the future. It might, I'm not sure whether it will be powerful enough to stand up against some of the um, existing powers and what we, you know, when they really dig their heels in. Um, but that's where I'm you know, drawing some hope from at the moment. That's great. Uh, that is a fabulous example. Have you, have you heard um, about the World Economic Forum's The Great Reset? Mm. So it's, um, you know, it's not going back to business as usual. It's not going to the new normal. It's, uh, it's not even a twist on, uh, on business as usual. It is a great reset. And um, I don't know how much you know about what I do, but I am an advocate for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and and a big activist environmentalist that kind of uh, have been looking for years for a global plan for the world to 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 use as a guide and a plan uh, um, to get us to the future. Uh, that, that will sustain us all. That's, I mean, <clears throat> when we talk about pirates, when we talk about ships, when we, you, know, you need a plan, you need to navigate your course. Otherwise you're drifting, you're just taking where the sea's taking you, where the wind blows you. 
it's nice to kind of have a plan. It's okay to change a plan mid course or pivot or do whatever that, that of course happens. But if you have a plan, it's, um, you know where you're going to go and you can also kind of envision, imagine and dream towards what it will look and feel like for me. Um, that plan is the 2030 agenda. It's the United Nations 17 sustainable development goals. And what most people don't know is that it is a great reset. It's not uh, the, the 17 sustainable development goals are not just targets and indicators and monies behind that achievement and, and all tied together as an intricate system. There's no way you could just work on one of the 17 goals and not touch on mm -hmm. the others because they're all set up like a system but it's a total new global economy it's a total new reset in how we do industry and innovation and gender equality and quality mm -hmm. education and how we go to zero uh, poverty and, and zero hunger and uh, that we really set the bar higher than any of our current operating systems or economies or models out there and we say this is a global plan and a global standard that will never go below. It's okay to still have your borders, your nations, your divisions. But what we're saying is that this standard is one that will never go below. Mm -hmm. We can still have the crazies and still have the na nationalism and whatever else is here. It's just this saying unified as, as humanity, we're never going to go below this standard. Mm -hmm. And, um, this great reset, I, I would like to know your feelings, your thoughts about it. Also, um, how that might tie to being more pirate. Also, um, how you feel if, if the Sustainable Development Goals or the Paris Agreement the, to December 2030, if that is a plan that, that could work for humanity or if you, it's okay. I've, I have many people on the show that are like, I don't believe, I'm not sure, I don't understand them, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to get a little bit of your insight and then maybe see if there's any ties to the book, to, to piracy, mm -hmm. because there's a, people who create, who have created this, people who are involved in this are, are, are other forms of pirates basically as well. Mm -hmm whether Gandhi was one of the, the core council at the United Nations and human rights uh, things uh, 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 many, many years ago. And uh, there's other pirates like that who have done wonderful things who've also been involved in these global futuristic plans out there. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do I... Do I believe? I'm making believe? it hard. I mean, for I, you. my first, my first thought was, you know, do I? I want you to ask you back. Do you think that development and sustainable are, is an oxymoron in a sense? Or is it? Is it are they? Do they fit together anymore? Because it depends on. Yeah, I mean, to, if we're talking about development in the way that most people would interpret the word development, and I had a thought throughout when you were speaking about how how a lot of this sometimes depends on semantics and the way that people interpret it um, about whether it's doable or not, and even when you're talking about the idea of having a um, a plan. And actually I usually say, Sam and I usually say to each other, the problem is the plan. Um, but only a plan in the sense of like a set by set, like stage by stage set of instructions that you have to follow, which is how a lot perhaps more might interpret a plan. But when you're talking yeah. about an ambition or a vision, slightly different. And what pirates would do is have a vision or an ambition and then have a compass to navigate it for. And then the compass is a set of principles and behaviors that you adhere to, but going off there. Um, no, I think that's I do, right. <laughs> do I, do I think, I, I guess I, I, when I started, um, after I'd spent some time in the Middle East, I actually worked on a permaculture farm and that was radical, you know, um, and it was in the, um, occupied Palestinian territories and it was people sort of, it was in the context of the Arab is the Palestinian Israeli conflict in the sense of, you know, they were having resources constrained by the Israeli state. So how can, how will people, can, can there be a more sustainable way to live off the land actually? So it was more a necessity rather than an environmental consideration. Although the people running the program had a back, well, ecologists had background in that. I you know, learned some incredible methods for how you could live with a lot less, but ultimately the people 
we were talking to about it still wanted to have you know modern gadgets and stuff you know why why do we have to exist with this when everybody else is getting the technology so there was a, there was a, a psychological resistance to from particular people in particular parts of the world and their circumstances towards not having um all the the gains that capitalism has brought um so i'd say that's that's one sort of conflict in my mind about whether it's possible to because uh, i kind of agree with the more fringe elements of what development should look like i think it sh we should be re reverting to more permaculture models um and i think <sighs> Yeah. Uh, and then I went into, um, I started working at uh, a campaigning organization, um, which is called Global Citizen, which was then the Global Poverty Project. So it was more focused on poverty and re poverty reduction. And we worked on what was the global, what was then the Millennium Development Goals. It was all aiming towards 2015. And if I look back at those now, I, I, would, I wouldn't have much faith in, in that. And a lot of that has to do with my experience since in terms of um, the kind of people, uh, I don't want, that's a bit, maybe a bit unfair, but what happens when you become part of the, the power dynamics and the power systems that we have at the moment, where you are part of an organization um, that is, you know, designated, the designated leader of change. I fundamentally believe that in order to create this kind of real global shift, it is going to have to be more democratic than it is without just one, you know, whether it's the UN or the, um, you know, the World Economic Forum kind of leading the way. Unless, it, unless it, it's really solutions that I think come from communities and people that works for them. And maybe part of that, maybe you'll have to tell me um, if that's what, if that's where it's heading. I, I actually think that that, that um where it is heading it's heading more that that we need the plan that there is a plan that it's actually five years into the plan now we've got 10 years left to go on it but but there's even a more important question so i'm glad to hear that you you know i i also work with global citizens and that you t started thinking about that or we're working with them back in the millennium development goals arena but can you tell me is there one global plan for our future is there is there a plan out there other other than the sustainable development goals that you know of um no there isn't a plan is there there isn't yeah, a there plan. Is so a... you're right it's a sense of like is this if, let's just what we are where we are and let's work with what we are what we've got and what we're trying to and i i i wouldn't I hear what you're saying. I don't, I wouldn't want to be in the, in the camp of people going, well, it's all just going to fail, you know? Yeah, that, that, there's what? a huge camp like that. That's yeah. for sure. But I mean, the other thing is even if there, you know, if maybe that's a little bit too rough, there's no other global plan that we could think of. I mean, we could probably mm. talk about the green new deal, the new mm. deal, mm. Um, w whatever you call it, but w even on a local regional or national level, there's not a lot of big plans that even cover uh, um, states. I get guaranteed in the United States, there is no plan. It's a chaotic, uh, um, mm -hmm. chaotic plan. It's to disrupt and lie and fa fake news or whatever. And, but if, if we look at other countries, what is the plan and how, how is it unifying? But how are those, even if it's a nationalistic plan or country-based plan, how is that tied um, to other nations, other countries, or to the globe, because in some respects, um, a, a plan like that is is similar to to what you mentioned earlier. That on on the pirates' code or a code of conduct or their what it ha what was the term that you used the yeah the pirate code the, the pirate the the pirate code and articles that everyone had to agree upon it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not one person. Well, the Sustainable Development Goals, 197 countries came together for the first time in history and agreed upon it. That's a mm -hmm. historical precedence. It's actually the first ever global moonshot. But even so, let's say that there's a nationalistic plan out there that's pretty good. And it's looking like, wow, Argentina has this great plan and or Chile has a great plan. And 
and it's really going to get them into the future. That plan eventually, because of the environment, the earth we live in, we're all breathing the same water or breathing the same air, drinking the same water, uh, polluting the same oceans, whatever it is, it all affects all of us eventually. So um, how do the effects of other nations affect that great plan that maybe Chile or Argentina have? And uh, so that's why, wouldn't it be nice to, to have some kind of a global plan also based on the basic models and thought process that you, that, you know, that are mentioned in the book. And so mm. uh, I know I didn't prepare you enough to get into some of the systemic and, and this, because when, when I read the book, when I think about it, I really look, look at, a, at the lens of sustainability and this long-term future. How could we apply that? Or even how could we use some of those tools to make us uh, reach these resilient, desirable futures, these goals and paths in the future. And, and you, there was one other thing I wanted to touch upon as well, where you mentioned development. There is a limit to growth, which, which could be considered development. It comes from the book uh, 1972, The Limits to Growth. The second book that came out was Beyond the Limits to Growth because we'd already went beyond. So development in that form or capitalism or GDP, there is a limit to that type of thing. Will we run out of resources? We just hit a, hit a wall. We've, you know, we've used everything possible and, and there's an end. But that's why sustainable development, because to, to sustain oneself, to be sustainable, to, means to have resources and monies and Mm. Uh, tools and operations and things for future generations to be around in the future. And, and it's more than just sustainable development. It's this one planet living. It's living within the safe operating spaces of planetary boundaries. It's living uh, as one planet living, circular economy, whatever you would say. And so those are all also concepts, you know, that, that, you know, you can go on the micro, but you go macro and you can, you know, they can expand on up. What makes you so convinced that this time around, you say 197 countries sign a deal. What, what makes you think this time around it's going to work? That, you know, there haven't been agreements on this before, that the science has been there for a really long time. Why is it only when there's, a, you know, I think a lot of people still don't feel the sense of emergency and a lot of people still don't believe uh, in the climate crisis. And, um, yeah, so I don't know, I guess what I'm interested in what's convinced you that, you know, having a plan is better than having no plan. And I, I, I guess the thing I would draw from it a little bit is, um, and perhaps where the pirate principles come in a little bit, is that pirate, being, being more pirate is about personal, is part in part about personal sense of agency and responsibility and freedom and able to do something. And when a, a plan is at a global level um, to be, you know, sort of given to citizens, that's not i mean we're just sit, sitting there at the mercy of whether our government does the actions that it said it will do or not so i'm really more interested in what people can do now on their own and that might be the ceo of you know a, a national or international corporation actually suddenly just making a personal commitment to going i want to be on the right side of history my kids are asking questions and i want to do this or it might be you know seeing the, you know the what if I just went out and, and did the thing and reclaimed the land and started to grow some stuff and said, look, this is for the whole community, whatever, or we pedestrianized our street. So that feels to me more like a plan <laughs> than, because I feel like I have a part to play in it in a way that I don't think people have, feel that they have a part to play in the, the global, you know, these big strategies that get made up by organizations. People don't relate to that. I think that was my problem with it over time. I agree, and I've I've heard that before, and uh, understand exactly, um, but what you mean, and I'd if you don't mind, uh, it's, I I'm really here to to speak with you, and not you hear a lot from me, but I would love to unpack it a little bit to see if it makes sense to you. Um, we don't know what the sustainable development goals are, are for, who they're for, and, and how to understand them. When they were presented to us, they were actually presented wrong to us. We didn't know, are they for cities, countries, governments? Are they for corporations? Who are they for? 
they're really for each individual. They are all tied to agriculture, seafood, food and beverages, all 17 mm -hmm. of, of the goals. And um, they're for each and every individual. Of course, they're also for countries, cities, governments and, and things as these grand plan, but it's really down to the lowest level. Um, I don't know if you, you believe this or if you um, understand this, but by having a structure, a plan in a, in a form of a discipline or guidance uh, of a plan, it's actually not confining or imprisoning in any respects. It's actually freedom because in that respect, you are securing your basic rights as a human being and gaining tons of freedom not only to move around the world, but also freedom that you will never get or go below a certain standard as a human being to be lesser than someone in the Western world or in the Eastern world or in developing countries that we all have the, the inalienable equal rights as human beings. The reason they're all tied to each and every single individual on earth is because of that fact that I said they're all 17 are tied to food. When, when, when we look at our world, most of our capitalism or our fights or conflicts around energy and resources. Mm -hmm. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the bottom two layers, breathing, food, and water, uh, security of body, resources, mm -hmm. security uh, of health. Um, those are for us, and just like the sustainable development goals, that's really how we need to view them as a wedding cake, a pie, or a pyramid, where the bottom layers are biosphere, life on land, life below water, climate action, and clean water and sanitation. sanitation. That's our biosphere where we get all resources from to make computers, airplanes, food, whatever it is, that's where we get those resources from. And without them, without that protective layer within our planetary boundaries, we can't reach the society uh, level or the economic level uh, of that different type of, of a pyramid for life. And so as we see each other as an integral part of, uh, of our symbiotic earth, as a part of this earth, as that we're all on the same pirate spaceship earth, so to say, that um, it actually gives us more freedom, more basic rights. And some of the things that, that I read from the pirate book, uh, the, the Be More Pirate, the first one was that, you know, uh, health and well being, insurance, uh, and equality of not only gender equality and, you know, love who you love and, and be with who you are. And uh, that's, you know, you're there, there's not this disparaging. Um, non-diverse type of environment where you're you're you know you're part of that organization and part of that team and and um you're also looked after in, in that respect and so those sdgs are for us and if we apply them understanding the exponential function as an individual um, by what we eat and how we move and how we create our organizations if we on the local level like you're saying we apply some of these these principles uh, 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 through the Be More Pirate, which give us resilience, which has mm -hmm. sustainability mm -hmm. in that, and yeah. change this broken system. We're actually we're actually adopting a lot of the things that are already in the Sustainable Development Goals. And the more we do that, it, more it puts us on this exponential curve to actually reaching them in time. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. To 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 wait for the future to happen to us, to wait for our governments to deliver the future for us. That's what. That's why we say sustainable development. It's a solid infrastructure of development, like a commercial housing, residential park, whatever it is, an infrastructure that humanity can live off of, and and that's what we need to get to that future, which at the same time draws down climate change, our greenhouse gas emissions, and caps our planet from warming. So, I mean, uh, that, that's how I see it, and I'm very optimistic about it, and I don't know if that answered your question, but, mm -hmm. but I, I truly mm -hmm. believe, so like when I talk about sus the sustainable development goals with people from the Philippines, the indigenous population from the Philippines, or people from Thailand, 
uh, from Bangkok that, uh, or from Africa, they're like, what the hell? We've never heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. What are all these colors? Indigenous people, they're like, but you speak it, you speak to them in a different way about resources and how they can have the same rights and equality and, and things that people in the developed countries or in the Western world have. And in that process, some different business models, some different operating systems, which all fall in line mm -hmm. with the development goals, because it is truly a new global operating mm -hmm. system. There's, uh, if the countries who sign that, which I don't think many of them fully understood, it's a new global economic system, a new global governance, infrastructure, laws, rules, at a much higher for human for humanity a level and yeah. if they understood that they're like oh what did we sign up for you know now yeah. you know i think that that's a really good point and and i'm, in, I'm glad you said about sort of testing out the, what um talking to people about them so my follow-up question would be how do you feel that they are received because i, I noticed that a lot in um that a lot of it is is a translation exercise for people sometimes um because when i hear goals i think oh there's a target there and just explaining that, no, this is about totally different models and this can take lots of different forms. Um, and I always bring it, because because my work is about going into organizations and talking to them on a smaller scale, they might have big ambitions relating to sustainability, but this is about, it always starts with the people in the room and what they think and believe and understand to be existing now and then what their current practices are. So you got to you kind of work with that. And what's interesting is they'll often have a set of values or a set of strategy or principles and I go what do you understand by this what do you mean when we say we're all creative like what is creativity here I mean are you really creative or is it actually quite a conformist culture where conformity is rewarded in terms of bonus structures and stuff so breaking it down like that is so important and that's where I again where I, I just prefer it to be at a slightly lower level when we're talking about a big world plan because that whole gets lost in translation to people and they'll kind of glaze over and they'll go, well, here's another plan. And I, I'm just to say, I'm not in, I don't think I'm in conflict with you. I'm sure that what is I in don't the, the detail in it is well thought through and probably does have a lot of the solutions that we need. It's just a case of then how therefore are we going out to people and talking about this? And that's actually why I've called then the follow up book is called how to, because actually I've noticed across all the work that I've done that so much of the, the, the point of whether something is successful or not successful is in how it is done. It doesn't matter if you can go and say, we're going to build a hospital. They're doing that here in the UK. They're going, we'll build some more schools, we'll build more hospitals. And it's like, well, what kind of hospitals will they be? Will there be places with it that have space for friends and family to be in them? Are they hospitals that will be built out of sustainable materials? How you are approaching all of this is more important. And, and that includes how we talk about the problems that we have and why. In fact, it's the, the underpinning of Be More Pirate as, some, as something that's successful because it's a story and it's a story that people can put themselves in and feel empowered by in a way that it's not telling them the system is broken well it is but it's but it's saying but you are the answer to this and um not that you know i don't know some new technological gadget is the answer in a sense not that i mean that plays part of the solution but um being able to step into that story own it and um that the story is a fun and engaging way to talk about change just grabs people's attention but that's a, a different tangent <laughs> well no not not really i mean uh you mentioned it in the beginning and i think it ties in nicely to that uh i believe you use the term systemic literacy mm. for sure you use literacy and mm. um that which is just another form of education around where we're going the reason i ask you and and you answered it so nicely um the burning question is you would not believe how many people don't don't ask themselves what's the future they don't have a plan when you ask them today or tomorrow or the next day it's different answer each time <laughs> it's continually evolving and changing and that's okay um, <clears throat> but without some form of, of discipline or plan or structure foundation form and i'm not i, I i'm about the least political or um, democratic. I'm, I mean, if you saw me a couple of weeks ago on my podcast, I, I definitely look like the black beard pirate, the big long beard and 
people are like, man, you know, it's not just the looks, but also where I try to call bullshit and, and I, on what people say and how we, we think about systems, our organizations with a little bit different tw twist, with more diversity, with more, you know, try, try to remove the biases and try to get into the sense making about what we're saying and where we're going. Most people really struggle with that question, which for me, um, listening to that uh, is worrisome because mm -hmm. right now we're, we're experiencing these civil unrest, this need for piracy, this need for what the hell's going on with our systems nobody has a plan and so people are waiting for the future to happen to them they're waiting for it to be delivered to them that's not going to happen if, if we're waiting for trump to deliver the future for us we're definitely fucked yes so um and what you know whether wherever you lived probably is the same so uh, as an individual as local and regional i'm full alignment with you we need to become mm -hmm. more pirate and we need to make sure that we create the future we want to see. Mm -hmm. We, we enter that disruption. We apply the things that are in the book and, and, and it's fun. It's so damn fun. And you can swear a little and you can be a little bit disruptive and you yeah. can have fun and there's exactly. such a community and, and you can make the world a better place. You can create that future that you would like to see because if you're waiting for your vote or your dollar to influence that systemic change, boy, you're going to be Rip Van Winkle or somebody very disappointed waiting so long. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree. This is the best vehicle I found to do this and to talk about how to be part of the change and be part of the future. My dad always used to say, to, well, when I try to have conversations with him about the future, He'd be like, you're the only person who cares about this. He's like, most people just want to get on with their lives um, and just, you know, make some, you know, look after their family, make their money, get a house. You're, you know, obsessed with these big systemic questions um, and no one else. Is. And I always thought that was very patronizing, but um, at the same time, you know, there, there is a point in that. And I think that was also very much my thought when I was working in, in, at the RSA and just feeling like we are in a bubble. I know this is a bubble. I know this is an echo chamber and we're reverberating the same thoughts back and forth across these walls and the same kind of people. Um, and it's got to go bigger than this and it's got to, and it's got to, and, and it's got to be a different vehicle. Um, and that's why I've just loved the, the sort of diversity that's come forward with more Pirate, the people I get in my meetups and people whose stories I've listened to <clears throat> have been so surprising. I think Sam was really surprised when the book, um, the responses to the book that he, you know, he thought he was writing it for millennials. He was like, the millennials have got the answer. They're the young people. They know about purpose. They know we've got to do things differently. And then the people that came forward were tended to be older and, and were people who'd worked in, in institutions for a long time were so frustrated deep down, but had, didn't quite know how to find their voice to suddenly switch paths and go, right, I'm a pirate now. Um, so yeah, but that felt really hopeful. I was like, wow, there was this really quiet, <sighs> sort of sway of people who need to be unlocked and um a lot of untapped power a lot of it and i just want to figure out how to tap into it and sometimes you know it's working out the approach that you take some people respond better to um things when i present them in a more res researchy sort of way <laughs> like you know hen hence i did a little bit of background research on why disobedience is useful and why it can get better outcomes and so that people go oh Look, I can underst I understand that, and that appeals to me um, because it's it's rigorous, and and some people love the story side of it as well, and go right, I'm done, I'm in this, like great. Um, so yeah, that's that's part of um, the mission. But I've I've been really um, yeah, I guess I've been really heartened by the seeing the responses to it and continuing to see them. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you yeah i'm gonna come come back to this and this is my this isn't something i really said before out loud um on any public but i think we we have to we it's more spiritual actually um we have to acknowledge the spiritual side of humanity um and that has to take at least equal priority to material needs and um and um yeah and 
every time I've seen that occur in, in people, the outcome tends to be better. And I, you know, I'd, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not talking about religion. I think people can be religious and not spiritual and people can be spiritual and not religious. I mean, in, and it's such a hard thing to describe. I've seen people do projects on this and not be able to get the language right around it. And it's something that's personal and felt, but, you know, a connection to the ecosystem of the, the world and the, the greater universe and humanity. And um, it allows people to be more peaceful, I think, in their endeavors. And I don't see how we are going to... Um, really overcome the greed and the um competitive impulses that fuel violence um and and also i guess it's a lot of the what i've learned or read a lot about in terms of why people come into conflict and part of conflict resolution studies and things is you know there's how do you unpick trauma and the traumas that people have gone through on whether it's on a um a kind of personal level or on a perhaps more um, systemic level um, and I, I it was something that occurred to me many many years ago when I was when I did study international relations because you're taught a very neoliberal um, version of how the world functions um, and that this is the system that's been created and it's because states are primarily sort of self-interested entities much like people are and I remember reading it because I was studying a lot of it through the lens of the cold war and also um, the Arab-Israeli conflict I thought I felt, or, you know, it was, it was a, a research tangent that I went down and, and kind of didn't get very far with it, but are nations also, de- much like people, dealing with personal psychologies and personal traumas that are varying in different degrees? So when I look at, you know, when I look at things like the Arab-Israeli conflict, these are countries that have, have um, traumas built into the history of the nation and the emotional and psychological memory of the nation that people bring in and it doesn't go you know so to look at them as just well we we just want to get resources it's not that's not from what i've read or everything that i read and everything that i experienced was not why they were behaving as they were behaving and so yeah so that's a very long answer to it to 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 really take into account everything that goes on i think that that is what for me would be a world that um works, works for, for everyone it works yeah. for everyone would, would have to be a shift in um, a spiritual sense and sort of looking at acknowledging trauma as a, a root cause for a lot of the reasons why we do what we do. There's a fabulous um, scientist. She was a fabulous scientist, Lynn Margulis. She was Carl Sagan's uh, first wife. And she came up with the, the term symbiotic earth. And it's a different form of uh, compassion, collaboration, um, a different way of feeling as an integral part of, of our earth. And in some respects, I, I, I feel and sense that. But when you mentioned that, you know, neoliberalism, there's also neo-Darwinism. Those are bullshit. Mm-hmm. They don't exist. <laughs> it's not, there is no natural selection, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive. Mm-hmm. That's not how our world works. Um, the, those are other views of very competitive and only the strong survive. Mm. Uh, it's really those who flourish, who are resilient. And, and, and uh, also what you described as a form of resilience, mentally, mm. uh, psychologically, physically uh, resilience as well, which, which, which bounce back. Those are ones who co- cooperate, collaborate and, and uh, join together as swashbuckling pirates on spaceship earth um to, to solve our problems <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I love the framework i love the book i i'm excited to to get my copy in september 2020 when the new book how to mm. be more pirate comes out uh i'm already reviewing a little pre pre-gift <laughs> and um i i'm i'm so excited and i, I want to talk to you again when maybe in a year when <laughs> you've had some more workshops from the new book under under your belt and to hear how it has gone i have mm-hmm. one last question for you and it's more of i'm asking you to give my listeners another gift 
if you could go up to each one of them ind individually or to all the people that you desire in this world and depart some wisdom of empowerment, a tool, a skill, or some learning that you have, whether it's from the book or something that has really empowered mm -hmm. your life or way of thinking, what would that sustainable takeaway for the entrepreneur, the inventor, the, the, the activist, uh, the NGO be? What would you depart with them and say, wow, damn, I never heard that before. Uh, what, uh, really helpful. Do you have something like that? I don't know if what I will say will be something that they've never heard before. Okay. Um, because I think a lot of wisdom is recycled wisdom. Yep. Um, the thing that has most helped me and I would say not so much maybe to the entrepreneur, but to the average person and really what I'm, what I think Be More Pirate appeals to and what we're trying to activate is the average person who has a lot more power than they think they have is to say, is to, is to persuade them and convince them to take, to take a bold leap of some description, because it isn't about the outcome. Actually, it's about the effect it has on you. The second I, stopped trying to protect myself necessarily from things ending or falling apart or whatever um things got better and i had beginnings that i couldn't have imagined possible had i not done that and that might seem like the most basic piece of wisdom in the world it's not revolutionary but you i mean it is in every single workshop i've ever done people are like i'm afraid and you, identifying a risk that you could take that where the consequences w are perhaps make you feel afraid, but aren't going to be life devastating for sure. Um, and doing that and just going, I'm going to be, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to hope that the net appears. Um, I think is one of the most, is the power, most powerful. It's the beginning of the, the book, the new book about um, the mutiny mindset is that you've got to um, step into the unknown a little bit. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. Do you have anything else you would like to depart to our listeners before I tell you goodbye? Um, other than pre-order our book. <laughs> no, <laughs> or buy it whenever this comes out. Um, well, just to say that, you know, Be More Pirate is a, is a community as much as it is a book and an idea. Um, so we are, and it's, and it's beautifully cycl cyclical in, in the way that it works and that every time, you know, I, I run workshops for companies, but um, I use the material from our community. I use the stories. I keep myself in the trenches, listening to what people are doing and the, the struggles that they have, the triumphs that they have, what they've managed to overcome, the kind of rules that they are trying to break. Um, and that's what informs all the content for the workshops and stuff. So it's so valuable. So I am always open to having conversations with people and talking to them about it. Um, if they've got stories to share. So that's all over on our website and you can, um, you know, just sign up, get involved, uh, join a meetup. So I, I do have one one last question for you. <laughs> does, does the next book have a pirate thing like this, a dead man's skull uh, on that? Oh. So uh, because <laughs> now when I'm when I'm at the UN conferences or at Davos, I either got to get a pin or something. I've got to I've got to let everybody know that I'm I'm there to be more pirate and kind of disrupt these very boring uh, meetings that they have and that mm -hmm. we need to, we need to get a little more um, disruption and pirates uh, joining this, the group. Yeah. The, the, the new book doesn't have that. I mean, this is a, it's a bigger conversation about branding and yeah, yeah. Um, you know, between separate publishers and that sort of thing. But the, you know, the, the, the front cover of the first book was intended to be, to be book face, to be pirate face that you could use in kind of a modern, 21st century Jolly Roger, a fly your flag. What I'm going to do is create, oh, I'm in the process of doing a few new things ahead of the book launch, but creating a sort of little downloadable badge that you could use on your website or somewhere to kind of just indicate you're on Team Pirate. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. And, so and I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Please take care and much success with the book. And I'll put the links in the show notes and everybody, please go and pre-order. <laughs> Take Thank care. you so much, Mark. Thank you. Appreciate Bye -bye. it. Bye.